Hello, I'm Andrew Hara, the host of The Bomb Squad. I wanted to tell you about my movies. All are available on Tubi, which is a free streaming service. The last ones is a zombie drama about how a pandemic and isolation could drive a group of people mad. When the virus hits, John finds himself alone and scared until he meets Michael, his protector. But when Karina, another survivor, enters the mix, everything that John and Michael knew will be turned on its head. The last one is a zombie virus movie that's somehow even more relevant today. Plus, it has zombies. Check it out. Borderland is a mexploitation film about living in El Paso. When Sarah finds herself in debt to the cartels, she has until sunrise to find some missing monies with the help of her executioner. Borderland is a true midnight movie and a lot of fun. Finally, the documentary Humble Spirits tells the story of the Hahn family, including champion Jennifer Hahn from El Paso, Texas. The entire Hahn family has grown up in the combat sports and has helped shape who they are both in and out of the ring. Humble Spirits, a family of fighters, is the perfect documentary for boxing fans of all ages. Check out Tubi to watch all my films. And now, let's start the show. Hello, welcome back to the Bomb Squad. I don't know how microphones work, so I lean into mine. Um, What's going on, guys? It's the new year. I don't know how many episodes we've done. But we have a guest, because William is still MIA. And so we wanted to have a cool guest, and I asked my friend Molly to join us. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for showing, uh, for coming along. And uh, tell us a little about yourself, Molly. All right. Well, I'm so excited to be here, first of all. Um, I am currently working as a preschool teacher, and then I plan on going back to school to finish my degree in more studies next year. But in my spare time, I uh, just watch movies obsessively. Um, and I also like to screenwrite in my free time. Um, yeah, and I just love movies. Like, I just love film. I just love, it's everything. Movie magic is my favorite thing. Amazing. Okay, so since it's the beginning of the year, you get the you get the option of saying, what was your favorite movie from last year? Ooh, shoot. Uh, I'm totally not prepared. I know. I did, not, I did not prepare for this question at all. <laughs> I'm really not. Cuff. Okay, I have to think. I have to think. <laughs> okay. uh, oh, you know what it might be? Um, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a Danish um, horror film. It came out on Shudder. It's called Speak No Evil. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I loved that. I thought it was amazing. Cool. I have it. I, like... My shutter is just a list of all the movies that I want to watch, and then I yeah. try to watch them, and then I end up watching like Uncle Sam, and I'm like, "What did I pick?" That? No, I just <laughs> I end up on Tubi, but yeah, well, cool. Yeah, I think that one. Yeah, now I have to watch it and tell you what I think. It's so good. Cool, interesting, but cool. So yes, as always, when we have a guest, we like to get them to pick, and so. Molly picked 2011's The Cabin in the Woods, directed by Drew Goodard, written by Drew Goodard and Josh Whedon, starring Kristen Connolly, Chris Hemsworth, Marvel's Thor, <laughs> Anna Hutchinson, and then it has Richard Jenkins and Bradley Winford, has Brian White. Has The cast is cool, and it's also like a list of like uh, favorites from Whedon. Like you could mm-hmm. tell he picked, he just brought people to come along. But yes, Josh, tell us what this movie is about without spoiling the twist <laughs> of the movie. Oh, man. Um, I mean, it's all twists, right? Um, yeah. Five teens go to a cabin in the woods, but is there more to it? That's that's my spoiler-free <laughs> review. <laughs> I know, you literally can't say anything. But, like, it, it doesn't really, because they start in, like, the underground. Like, it's, like, it's right. telling you right it's away not that it's not, like, well, you know. And it was funny, um, because when this this movie, like, I think it premiered at Sundance, or South By, or some one of those big festivals. And so coming out of the premiere, everyone was talking about this movie, but they weren't saying why. They, like, it was so good. And it kind of came right after Evil Dead. And mm-hmm. Evil Dead came out, and it had the same kind of reaction. And so Evil Dead's scary as hell, the remake. 
And so this one kind of played up on that. And so all the marketing was like, you're never going to believe what happened in this movie. And like, this is a movie you're not, you're shocked. You're going to be shocked at what happens, which is true. But it is even like the marketing was kind of a bait and switch, which I really enjoy when the marketing even tricks you. Mm -hmm. So Molly, why did you pick this movie? Um, Because I think, I mean, going in, I saw it when I was like, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years old. And so going in, I just watched it as like a funny, scary movie, just kind of like a horror comedy. And I was like, oh, this is like funny and I enjoy it. But then growing up and, you know, going to some like classes for film and stuff, I, you know, realized there's, there's so so much stuff under it. That's just laying there waiting for you to realize it. And so upon rewatching, it's just, it's the whole entire film itself is essentially the set of a movie with all the key players, which I'll explain later, but I just, it's one of those movies where every time you rewatch it, you will find something new. I rewatched it last night, probably like my seventh or eighth rewatch. And I found like, I have three pages of notes just on different things that I found. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's just, I don't know. It doesn't get the, the, the praise that it deserves. It's so smart, but it's on yeah. the nose. So it's not for everybody. But like, once you figure out all of the inner workings of everything, it's just like, it all comes together and oh, it's so good. Yeah. And it's kind of like, before we started, we talked a little bit about um, audition mm-hmm. and this movie kind of has a similar thing where like, it's almost so flashy because so much is like happening to you and it has such style mm-hmm. that you kind of forget that there's an underlying message that's yeah. very smart, that they're not really like, like they're feeding you one message and it's a good one, but then they have like a secret message underneath it. And so it's really like, yeah, watching it again, I was like, oh yeah, this movie is really clever and it's really smart, which is interesting. Um, And okay, so as we start, there's no way to talk about this movie without spoiling it. So we do have to spoil it a little bit. um, And I feel like we'll just go into a general discussion, but yes, so it's four teens, they're going to the woods, but you immediately find out that Richard Jenkins and Bradley Winford play like these agents in this like secret underground, like government kind of black ops thing. And their whole goal is to kind of make sure that all the teens, but one get killed by these monsters. And if they, and they're doing it because it's kind of like the human sacrifice that the old tribes used to do has evolved. And this is the new like evolution. And so they're trying to appease the old gods from, waking up from their slumbers how they say it and so immediately they tell you this but it's very fun because you're kind of watching this movie and there's two stories going on and you want them both to win because you have like the teens and you want the teens to survive because they're like very likable but then you have this agency and they're also like fighting for the world and they're also likable so you don't want them to die and so it's very interesting that you're rooting for two different things and they both have completely opposite goals from each other, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. But what do you guys think? Oh, I don't even know where to start. With this. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I'm going to start with the whole overarching kind of movie set vibe that okay. it has. So as I was rewatching it this time, I, I, I realized that it's just like, it's essentially supposed to be, the set of a movie so like the kids are essentially the actors they are the people that have no free will no choice and they're all pulled by strings by the people who are like directing it so like the underground lair is going to be the writers and the directors and the crew and they're the ones that set everything up for the actors to do and then the gods that are underground are the audiences and they're the ones that'll like riot and get upset if they're not given something that satisfies them which is right. kind of the state of audiences today and in 2011 <laughs> like yeah and it's even funnier because like there's a point where Anna Hutchinson who plays Jules who's playing like so every character is playing an archetype and so mm-hmm. Chris Hemsworth obviously is jock Dana is the virgin even though she's not really like they kind of bend the rules mm-hmm. and Jules is playing the slut even though she's not. And it's kind of funny. Yeah, like they, they like push they them. Little things. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. like at the beginning when we're introduced to Chris Hemsworth, 
uh, Dana's like putting away her school books and Chris Hemsworth's like, oh, don't read this school book. This one's kind of bullshit. Read this one. Yeah. And you're going to impress the teacher. He recommended um, it was a book about Soviet economic theory and like what what athlete archetype is going to be doing that. Yeah, because yeah, later yeah. he's like, don't be a pussy, bro. You know, because he's all yeah. drugged up. Yeah. <laughs> So they were all my I my little theory is that either way, even if like Marty had died at the end, I think the gods would have revolted either way because all of them were forced into the wrong character. So like Dana, for instance, first thing we see her in, she's not wearing pants. And like that right. in in people's brains is gonna equate to like, oh, that's kind of slutty, you know? And then also the first thing that we hear about her is that she had an affair with a college professor. Which, like, right. having an affair with a college professor versus Jules in her, like, long-time relationship, like, obviously people are going to look at Dana as the whore. And the same goes for, um, what, Kurt and Holden. Holden is, like, an all-American football player and comes right. on an academic scholarship. They just got them all mixed up. <laughs> and they were, and they, because the, the crew in the background, they were all forcing them into these different archetypes based solely on what they looked like. And because right. there wasn't that like actual character behind them, obviously the gods weren't going to be pleased because the characters weren't written well. Right, right. Yeah, that, you know, and I didn't think, and I thought about that because at the end, uh, a secret character that we won't mention yet <laughs> um, says that calls Holden the academic mm -hmm. but like the whole movie he doesn't really say or do yeah, anything no, exactly yeah it's like he wears glasses i think you know yeah. like it's like <laughs> yeah. that's it it's just not his ball well, yeah. to me like what's interesting like about it is like because obviously it's like john sweden is like the screenwriter saying like oh like audiences will rebel if you don't like give them what they want which is like kind of like the, the the horror tropes it's like mm -hmm. in 2011 yeah that was true but then he like lived that with like the shitty justice league movie that like people rebelled against so hard you know it's like it's like oh man he fulfilled his own prophecy yeah, you know it's like yeah. and he did fit try to fit superman into the wrong trope <laughs> right yeah it was very like oh we think we're giving you what you want but you still like hate it you know and it's like <laughs> and it is like because it was relevant in um 2011 but oh man, it's super relevant. Oh, yeah. With like Twitter wasn't you, even like, like a cesspit then, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I saw some like there's I mean, there's obviously bad takes, but sometimes you see people who give like just mid takes, like, oh, I didn't like this movie. And then people are like, oh well, and you like like searching their Twitter. Yeah. So it's like, I don't think you have to do this for this movie, like or for like any movie, really. Like, <laughs> unless it's yeah. like a racist or a sexist thing. Mm -hmm. If they just didn't like it, like, oh, okay. We used to just do that. I'd be like, oh, that's not for me. Yeah. Um, which is, again, one of the reasons we created this podcast was because we saw, like, film criticism was so, like, uh, uh, over, like, critical and, like, yeah. kind of, like, wanting to look for mistakes as opposed to wanting to enjoy a film that we were like, oh, well, let's see if we can take a different approach to that kind yeah, of movie. Yeah, that cinema and, uh, ruining everything. Yeah, well, like, oh, he's man, not holding the coffee cup in this scene, and then he is in the next. Yeah. It's like, who gives a shit? It's, yeah. Yeah. they probably did 10 takes. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, and, okay, so the kids are, like, going to this cabin, that's Kurt's cousin, and they kind of, like, go to this uh, gas station, and it's, like, the classic gas station where the guy's, like, don't go there. Don't go to that cabin. You'll <laughs> you'll get trapped. And also, I just want to add because this is super important. The agency, uh, the Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford, mm -hmm. their characters are very much treating this as if they're just like it's just a Monday morning. Like mm -hmm. they have a big project, but they don't really like. They're talking about like going to get drinks tomorrow, and they're like still messing around. So it's it's given that kind of air of like they don't. They're like that very much like way like if you've seen Burn After Reading where they treat like this is how the FBI treats people. And as a matter of fact, Drew Goodard bases on uh, he lived in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is where I am. And um, just the idea that like these guys were working in Los Alamos and like building nuclear bombs, but they still had to like go grocery shopping. They're still like your neighbors and stuff. Yeah. And that's the approach that these guys have. And I think it works really well to keep them from being complete asshats the whole time you know yeah 
Yeah. What I do like though is the kind of like um, when the guy, the guy at the gas station, the creepy guy, Mordecai. Like is calling them to be like the, the the lambs are on their way to the slaughter. Like he still takes it like deadly serious, and it's like you should because it's literally the world at stake. But yeah, like they make fun of him right. for it, you know. It's, yeah. it's, and that's good times. That's a great scene because again, they do this a bunch of times where it's like he's taking it, he's giving it the gravity that it needs, and he's literally being laughed at because he's like. Like he's saying what's gonna happen if they don't succeed, and they're like, "Okay, buddy," and they just like yeah. hang up. <laughs> it's a, and like it's all the casting in this is a, like every time I watch this movie, I wonder why like Jules hasn't been in bigger stuff. Like, mm-hmm. like everyone is doing such a good job that like the casting is top notch. Yeah. yeah, and so like they get to the cabin. And they just kind of like hang around with teen stuff. Mm -hmm. And like they find a two way mirror that they shouldn't have. And so, like, things are already off, but they're like still like, oh, whatever. And then they go downstairs to the basement. And one of like the best scenes in the movie, because we know that like the what the agency says is that the teens, like, they can manipulate it as much as possible, but the teens have to pick. And so they set that gas station up because the teens have to. Listen to that guy, warn them, and then still leave. Yeah, it's like they choose to walk into danger, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And so when they go into the basement, they have to um, pick, like, their destruction. And so there's all these cool, like, Easter eggs, especially if you're a horror fan. I mean... It's like a horror fan's wet dream, essentially. Just every (laughs) every reference that you want is there. (laughs) Which was your favorite thing in the... Mm. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to go with the Hellraiser yeah. ball thing and just Chris Hemsworth just being like, do, 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 do. <laughs> like it was so funny. The, uh, the puzzle again, like, orb the... instead of the puzzle cube. Yeah. yeah, it was good. And the, the set design is, or the production design is so good because like that thing is on camera for like two scenes, mm-hmm. but it looks like as good as the Lament configuration. Yeah. I feel like that one's also my favorite one. I mean, we just did every Hellraiser, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, obviously, yeah. like, the Merman is, but, because that comes back in such a good way. What's the, the, what's the Merman's artifact? Thing? It's the it's the it's conch, conch shell. shell. He's about to blow oh, on it and right. then doesn't. <laughs> well, then there's ones like you, like, she has, like, a necklace, and you're like, I don't know what that's going to be, like. Mm. Yeah. You don't know what would make a giant a... snake show up, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, you have the ballerina, and that one's clearly a ballerina we'll yeah. see later. Yeah. And that's the other cool thing is that there's a bunch of stuff, but not everything is, like, told, like, what it is. So mm-hmm. you get to, like, imagine, which is fun. And so they pick a book. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is, like, it's going to unleash some zombie rednecks mm-hmm. that are, like, super Christian-y and, like, um, like weird like pain <laughs> fundamentalists yeah. Yeah. yeah well you know, what's good too is in this is kind of where it starts and i don't know if you'd call this like a spoiler but the the stoner of the group marty is he he is not affected by like the pheromones and stuff they're giving um because he's too high to be affected it's like yeah. the it leads me to one of my only complaints about this movie is that Marty is in, introduced by smoking a bong and drinking coffee at the same time. And it's like a bong coffee thing. Yeah, and you, he's you like, don't drink your bong water. You don't do that. I was like, what are you doing? Right, right. No, there's, I mean, there's a couple little misfires, but I, I forgive it. But he, he kind of becomes the, you know, the audience surrogate in the movies, the ancient gods, but the audience surrogate for you as the viewer is him yeah, being like like, like she's yeah. like oh and then like she's about to read the like the latin he's like don't read the latin you know <laughs> like what are you doing um uh, so, yeah. so it's like he's constantly trying to talk them out of it you know as they keep like going deeper so it's like oh it's like he's like along the ride with you which is which is fun times yeah. you know yeah yeah and i think that that's but cool. they read the and latin anyway of that course bong, that. apparently that they made that bong and it worked yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the, yeah, and, and the, the the zombies come up, and like it's kind of funny because you see how much they manipulate. Like right after they mm-hmm. unleash the zombies, they don't know that they've come out, and so Chris Hemsworth and Anna Hutchinson like go to like start making out, and they're like raising the temperature of the outside and like adding through because she complains it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it's fun. Like and again, 
It's a perfect, because, like, they also explain, Emmy Acker plays Lynn, who's from a different department, but she's, like, friends with these two. Um, and so they kind of explain throughout the movie, and you get little hints that there's, this is happening not just in America, but mm-hmm. everywhere, in, like, a bunch of different other countries. Like, later you see Buenos Aires and uh, Japan, of course, is talked about a lot. And it's such a good example of, like, Americans over, like, militized idea of everything, yeah. where, like, they're raising the lights and they have like vents everywhere and they're not like the the stuff that they have hidden it's like hidden in the most obvious way that you just like marty moves a lamp and he sees or he breaks a lamp and he immediately sees a camera it's like how are you this bad at this? <laughs> yeah. yeah something i thought was hilarious was the amount of times they mentioned japan because obviously the two giants in the horror industry are going to be like right. america and japan and the movie itself admits that Japan has always done it better. Um, they talk about how 98 was a disaster. And that's the year that The Ring came out in Japan. And that's when J-Horror started taking a hold on everything. Right. And there's even a line when the two um, guys are talking to each other. I forget their names already. Um, but he mentions that, like, oh, we can always count on Japan. Japan has never failed once. Right. And, like, they're better. And then they say, he, he mentioned, he was like, Japan has always been better, but we try harder, which I thought <laughs> was so funny. That is so American, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's cool because, like, when you see them, uh, like, Japan is obviously, it's like a bunch of schoolgirls, yeah. and then there's, like, the very uh, Asian horror ghost that's kind of in the middle. And so it's kind of cool because it's clearly, like, they're, they clearly like Japan, and so it's an mm-hmm. homage while they're like kind of talking about yeah it. I know. yeah and so it's a lot of fun to see like in when they show Buenos Aires there's like a big uh, Bigfoot type yeah yeah and there was also a reference to the thing in that same yeah, yeah. Sweden Sweden fails first Sweden. and when they show it yeah they show the yeah. uh, um the outpost that's on fire yeah. and they <laughs> that's one of and those of course, like if you thing, if you pause one of those scenes outpost. there's like 30 different references yeah. in like that like 30 seconds you know and we didn't even mention the other scene with 30 different references because to like they have an ongoing bet at the beginning yeah, it's like a betting <laughs> it pool. doesn't even yeah. sound so bad <laughs> And you, it's funny, like, to talk about how likable this agency is, because everything <laughs> they do is so scumbag. But they have this board, and everyone's, p- like, betting on what monster the teams are going to pick. And you see, like, zombies and, and like, redneck zombies who they end up going with. And then, like, one of them just says Kevin. And, so <laughs> like, what is that one? <laughs> and so that's, like, even, I feel like even if you didn't like this movie, just, like, watching all the Easter eggs would be so mm-hmm. fun to see. Like, because you get to see, like, obviously, you know, Drew Goodard is, like, in love with horror. And so he really puts every reference he can into this movie. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, they pick the zombies and then um, they start picking them off. And, like, one of the, like, there's, like, a scene. So they, they kill Jules. And then everyone else is like, we need to get out of here. And so they get to the RV. And there's like a cool scene where, like I said, like you're constantly wanting both of them to win because everyone is in the RV and they're like taking off. And uh, the agency realizes that the entrance that they came in on, like through a tunnel, hasn't exploded and they're supposed to have exploded so they can't get out. And so Richard Jenkins is like running through the agency, like trying to get like to close this so it explodes. And they're trying to get out and you kind of both want them both to win. And so it's a very, like, it's just constantly, like, having you root for two very different groups. And it's a lot of fun the whole time. This That also leads to, because, yeah, when they get trapped in there, there's a motorcycle. One of my favorite <laughs> scenes in the movie. Because cause you, you do assume that Chris Hemsworth is, like, you know, essentially the hero of the movie. Because look at him, you know. Um, right. <laughs> and he, he tries to jump the cliff. But like the force shield they set up, just he smash. Like not only does he smash into it, but his body keeps hitting it on the way down right. as it like <laughs> like tumbles into the abyss. It's so good, even knowing yeah. it's coming. Like I laughed. <laughs> yeah, and again, like you know, the writing of this is so good because like these teams. I mean, they just have to be there. There literally could be anything, and it could have been so easy to make them unlikable. Yep. But 
none of them are like you feel bad anytime any of them get killed and so it's like i don't know to me it's always funner when the characters are likable because it makes it raises the stakes because like if someone gets separated you don't want them to get killed you know (laughs) and so like it kind of like adds another level and so like yeah the writing is just off the wall great yeah something else i noticed this watch around was um something that they did with the characterization is that everybody but marty has like a significant change from when they enter the cabin to when they go down to the basement so like um dana starts dressing more homely or modest as you would um jules is now in like a crop top and cut off shorts and is acting all like frisky and stuff Chris Hemsworth gets a Letterman jacket that he never had. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Holden gets glasses, like these little nerdy square glasses. Right, right. Never had, never had. And there's just all these little <laughs> tiny things that are being added that like, obviously as a first time viewer, you're not really going to pick up on. You're just like, mm. oh, okay. But then you realize that these characters are so out of place that they've really had to manipulate everything to make them fall into that archetype well they could eat because yeah. like when uh, when they finally are aware like oh like redneck zombies are trying to kill us they're they're all together and chris Hemsworth is like okay guys we need to stick together we can't get separated and then they pump more gas and he's like actually no let's split up we'll cover more ground that way and Marty's like wait what yeah. <laughs> and it's like yeah, yeah just this very I'm blatant see- forcing it i loved it and there's even like a little bit of foreshadowing that you don't know the first time you watch it because Mar- like they all get separated in their rooms and the, the agency locks them in and Mar- that's when Marty finds the camera mm. and then they um, then one of the zombies like pulls them out of the window and fights them and you see him get uh, you see him off camera get killed um, and so then the whole ground shakes because they tell like every time someone gets killed they press a button and it kind of like does a ritual Mm -hmm. to let the gods know that someone's been killed and so they press it for marty and the whole thing shakes and like they're like oh someone's excited down there and then later you find out that marty didn't get killed he actually got away they just like didn't double check and so watching it again you're like oh they weren't like shaking the ground because they were excited. They were shaking it because they were pissed because yeah. they didn't do it. It's subverted, yeah, yeah the, the trope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's... And and that, that's also kind of cool that, like, if we're talking about the gods as an audience, like, they don't like subverting the trope, which is very interesting. <laughs> like, it's an interesting commentary <laughs> on the movie-going audience, you know? On top of that, something else I thought was interesting was how they mentioned that, like, the gods or audiences have been getting bored with just like sacrifices so more just like pure horror for what it is and now they're demanding like stories and a plot and characters um so that that the fundamentals of horror are just not enough for audiences now yeah and again like speaking of movie sets uh yeah there's like we i i remember on set we always like anytime even if there's a kissing scene you kind of have to like close off the set because there's like a scene where um jules and chris hemsworth are like making out and stuff and then it cuts to the agency and there's like every guy is just watching the screen and they're they're like get out of here that is that that's a very film you do have to kick people out literally like on the day that there's like stuff and it does it's all it's not just sex scenes but it's also like violent scenes Suddenly, everyone is available to work on set, and they're all there because they want to see like the special effect. And so that was like I thought that that was super funny that they like well because they, they they even have like a, they have like a military lays on like and there and he, he's not like much of a character but he's just kind of like there to like you know be like oh what is this but he's like oh he's like the audience surrogate for their side right right like, kind of, to, to, to kind of like get exposition but he's like do we really need to see this like do we really need to like watch this it's like oh it's not for us it's literally yeah, yeah. like they demand like the, the gods demand that you see the sex scene you know which is yeah which is like again another fun and like it even happened i remember after terrifier 2 like a bunch of fans got mad at the main actress because she didn't get nude and they're like horror movies need more nudity and she's like there's like there is nudity in terrifier 2 yeah. it's just they wanted like i guess every single female actress to get naked and it's like yeah this is such a weird thing to complain about, especially like yeah. by that point, I think well, like the movie had been out for a month. It's like, you've been holding this back to tag the actress. Yeah. Like what is she supposed to do? Like send you nude pictures? Like, what do you want? What are you trying to get out of this? 
But yeah, that's my spiel on horror. Fans. I mean, they, they don't know what they want. I mean, you guys are way more on horror Twitter than me, but either they're all, someone's always mad about something, you know? So, but yeah. And so eventually like Marty comes out, he, and he ends up like helping Jules and that's when they figure out that he's alive. Mm-hmm. And then they all like Marty figures out that like, Oh, he finds like a, an entrance hatch to the agency, which you find out is underground beneath everything and so they eventually get there to another (laughs) to the other best scene in this movie which i've described (laughs) every scene i feel (laughs) and so they get in an elevator and they start going down and it's you realize that it's the elevator that they brought the zombies up in and so they you like they get put in this kind of holding cell where you see a bunch of other zombies or like monsters and like you see the ballerina who's just like a ballerina, but her face is gone and it's just teeth. <laughs> and then the, you know, you don't really see this guy again, but there's like a ghost where he, you can only see him when he puts his hand like on the on the glass, and you see his face for a second. You know, it's very hard to make ghosts look scary, and that's an actual scary design mm-hmm. for the game. Yeah. Like all the designs are great. Gonna, this this is actually scary. like this is 2011. I feel like the CGI. Um, is as good yeah. as like any like big like Marvel, and maybe it's because they really only had to do like good CGI for like a good 20 15 minutes, you know. But it's all pretty like exceptional, like it holds up, you know. Yeah, yeah, so and like, yeah, I just love like I, I could watch that scene over and over, and like, even though I know it's a movie and I've seen it every time I watch it, I'm like, go to another one, let's <laughs> see <laughs> someone else. <laughs> um, and so then like the agency, like they send a security guard, he's like tries to get him out. And there's like kind of a scuffle, and then they manage to like open every single cage, and they That's start attacking. Scene. That's my favorite scene in the whole movie. And like the way it's filmed, that scene because it's like a wide angle mm-hmm. shot of the entire hallway, and the soldiers have come in, and then the the things open, and it's like immediately they're all just yeah, there's a like, little <laughs> ding, and then boom. <laughs> yeah. And then the best part about because you see all these monsters come in. And then the best part about it is it keeps dinging because there's so many monsters. Right. <laughs> Which, again, feels like a very American thing that they had, they would just yeah. collect monsters. <laughs> yeah. I, I will, the first time I watched this movie, I was very like, oh, they wouldn't just have a button that releases it. But I feel like coming back to it, I was like, no, like the American government is that dumb. They would yeah. have that button <laughs> and it would be like not that hard to like turn on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Something I also thought was hilarious hilarious with that scene was that um, the whole movie is kind of critiquing, you know, the audience's need for gore and blood and they want more and more and more. And then they give it to us. <laughs> right, right. Everything and just every like horror thing that we could possibly want is just pour it out. And it's all of the gore. And it was just amazing. And I mean, like they were like, they were right. I was a satisfied customer watching that movie. <laughs> Carnage. I yeah. loved that scene. Yeah. Every time it happens, it's like you're you feel like a kid again. You're like, yeah, <laughs> I kill. And it's so like there's one ro- there's like this one monster. It's like a robot and it's like a 1980s like, yeah, like- style robot. And it just has like a hand with a knife on it. <laughs> and you see it kind of like just going up and down. It's like <laughs> What does that guy do? Like, if they had picked this guy, yeah, what was he gonna yeah, do? Yeah, how 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 would that have worked in the cabin of the woods? Set? I do like the ones that just clearly would not have like fit like the, yeah. the setting at all. I, I do. I especially like, like when they um when they use them, like they have a unicorn. And when I saw him the first time, I'm like, how's that unicorn gonna kill someone? And then later, you see him like ram his horn into some dude. <laughs> It's, it's, it's good yeah and then like it's cool like because then they have like that clown and they have like mm-hmm. so they, the great thing about it is they have a mix of ones that you're familiar with like the clown obviously they have zombies they have regular zombies they have like a big bat but then they have like the unicorn which you wouldn't expect the weird robot dude there's like uh the snake the giant snake, the snake. Yeah. yeah the merman which we'll talk about a little bit more later um <laughs> And so it's like a bunch of stuff that you like. It's a mix of scarecrows, um, and so it's kind of cool that they like. I don't know how fun would it have been to just like be in there writing that script and picking like your favorite monsters to put into it, you know? So yeah, it's a lot of fun. And then so then they like kind of work their way down, 
and they hear a voice that kind of explains to them that like you're supposed to be human sacrifices and it's a familiar voice but they keep like working their way out they're still fighting people eventually like the the guys from the agency we've been following get killed and like it's funny because Bradley Winford, he has like this joke, or Richard Jenkins at the beginning tells him this joke, like he's kind of making fun of like the people who picked bad choices. Oh, because he and always picks, Jenkins, he like, picks merman every time, right? Yeah, he's yeah. like, he picked the merman every time. <laughs> and he's like, what's wrong with the merman? And then so at the end, when they're getting attacked, he like gets flung from an explosion and he's like kind of recovering. And then he sees something coming towards him. Like slowly. And, yeah. the <laughs> and he even looks at the camera. He's like, ah, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. yeah it like, it, and it has so, like a like, blood ugh. spray out of its back. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. It was just, <laughs> yeah. Which it, like, it would have been, it would have been funny if the merman couldn't get him, but I think it's way funnier that the merman gets them. And it's like super violent and disgusting. Because it's like you wouldn't think that a merman would bite you and then blood would spurt out his blood, yeah. but it doesn't work. <sighs> but yeah, so good. Yeah. Um, and so then they like go downstairs to the basement, and that's when they're like, it's like they're trying to figure it out, and that's when our special guest comes out, who's played by Sigourney Weaver, Ellen Ripley herself, and she kind of says like. Oh yeah, like you have, like you guys have to die. Like it's it's a choice between you and kind of everyone in the world. So like, what are you gonna pick? And like, they kind of like fight, and then eventually Sigourney Weaver um, gets killed, and then they decide like, you know, we're just gonna like see what happens. And then like the the last shot is a hand coming out of the ground and like squashing as you see like the old guts come back to life. Um, and so, like, again, like, it's kind of hard to talk about this movie just because you have to spoil the whole thing. So I hope you've seen it. <laughs> yeah. After I've it, I hope you saw it. Um, but I, it's also one of those movies where I think if someone spoiled it to me, I wouldn't be that annoyed. I mean, just in general, but, like, you don't, it's not like a, oh, what's going to happen next? It's more of a, like, how are they going to do this story mm -hmm. kind of movie. But, yeah, so and I think that that kind of, like, he, and here's the thing. What do you got? Because... I know the original choice for the Sigourney Weaver character was Bruce Campbell. And Sigourney Weaver was the second choice. But I kind of feel like out of the choices, I feel like it should have been Jamie Lee Curtis. Because both uh, yeah. I could Sigourney see Weaver and Bruce Campbell are kind of outliers of the horror genre. Because mm -hmm. I like that it's a female because like that whole final girl trope yeah. makes it and, like the screen queen. So you want like Bruce Campbell would have felt he would have been appropriate, but it would have felt out of place just because he's a guy <laughs> and then like Sigourney Weaver has really been an alien and like uh Ghostbusters and like Alien's great of course but Jamie Lee Curtis has been like in Halloween and Terror Train and like so many so every time I see him I'm like oh, I kind of wish it was Jamie Lee Curtis that's the only thing that I'll say I I wish they had changed other than the, like getting high and then doing stuff like what is he what is he Superman <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, oh, I don't know. Sigourney Weaver is such a good voice, though, you know? Yeah. And she is amazing. Such like, a good, like, gravitas, yeah. yeah. And it is kind of that thing where it's like, I feel like people forget Sigourney Weaver is such a great staple in the horror genre. Mm -hmm. So, like, it is, like, don't get me wrong. Anytime Sigourney Weaver shows up, I'm like, I'm on board. You, you won me over. Although this is my, like, this is still my, like, if I could change anything. Um, I do... I, obviously Bradley Whitford's death amazing love it don't change a thing yeah. I kind of wanted Richard Jenkins to successfully like kill him and like like get things back on track only because that would um essentially complete the metaphor of like oh the audience's revolt but it's like no no the audience will be placated which is kind of like what happened you know essentially like right. Like, the audience still just kind of went back to being like, okay, like, I liked it, you know? Like, and this movie didn't do, like, amazing, didn't do bad. Like, it made money, you know? It was, like, a, it was like a pretty good hit. But it's, like, it didn't just, like, bust open the genre forever, you know? And I was, like, I, I almost right. want... I also just like Richard Jenkins' character a lot. <laughs> so I feel like yeah. it would have been almost nice to see him, like, kind of be like, okay, I did my job, you know, after everything right. else, like, failed, so... Well, see, and that kind of leads me into another idea that I had. And I, I barely, like, realized this watching it this time. And I think subconsciously I might have thought of it. But, like, you know, you have the movie stuff, of course. You have the horror, 
like, uh, you know, critiques, of course, in this movie. Those are like the big ones. But there's also like an underlining theme that I feel like, especially now, is super important where it's like um, at no point do these, does anyone in the agency, even any of the teens ever like see, like ask, how can we stop the gods? You know, like, mm-hmm. it's just like, how can we placate to them? And I think about this and like, this is going to be way off. This is like, I'm going to have to pull out the scholar, but <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> Um, as like a few weeks ago, you know, when Andrew Tate got arrested, there was all that like, oh, well, young boys don't have any, uh, you know, male, positive male role models. And like, so they gravitate towards Andrew Tate and they become white supremacists. But it's not that young boys don't have positive male role models. It's that young boys don't have positive male role models that are telling them what they want to hear, which Andrew Tate does. He tells them like, it's not your fault. It's women's fault. Women suck. They only want money. And that, like, nobody, no, like, these teens don't want to hear, oh, if you, like, want to be more presentable to, like, the opposite sex or whoever you're trying to create, you probably have to work on yourself and, like, be a better person and, like, kind of do all those things. And so because of that, they're, like, they want to, like, oh, well, let's bring a positive Andrew Tate. And it's, like, no, you have to go back and teach boys that, like, if you ask a girl out and she says no, that's fine. Like that, she doesn't hate you. She's not like a bitch. She's just, she's not into you. And then you find a partner who is into you, you know? And so like, it's like, you have to dismantle the system if you want real change. And I kind of feel like that's why this ending works so well for me because Richard Jenkins and the agency are trying to get things to work. And these guys are trying to just survive but it doesn't really matter because the bigger problem is the blood ritual. I get it. Blood ritual. I I do get it. And the bigger (laughs) problem with us is like, yeah, the bigger, the problem isn't Andrew Tate necessarily. The problem is that we live in a patriotic society and we have to fix that. And we fix that. We don't have to worry about Andrew Tate because he's a non-entity. And so maybe I went too far into (laughs) the themes of this. (laughs) No, I I see what you're saying. And it's like, you need to entirely like erase the system. Um, Mm -hmm. But I guess to me, like the idea, like, it's like, you know, this, like, you know, they wouldn't like, I don't know, like the the system like remains like, so for the metaphor to like, to like continue, but it's like, you do want to destroy the system. They also did say, I think that the reason they ended it with everyone on earth dying is because they, wanted it to be so definitive that they'd never ask for a sequel which you know i like that too it didn't work <laughs> oh yeah they did try it. too right <laughs> they, they, well and it's kind of that thing where on one hand i would like to just explore the world more but mm-hmm. on the other hand it ends so well that it's yeah like, and i guess those are the best movies the ones that you want to see more even if there's nothing else to give you because know? if we saw like even a prequel we know how it's gonna end <laughs> like, you know that's true yeah. What do you think, Molly? Would you want a sequel? Um, or? not necessarily. I like. I would like a. I want Drew Goddard and Yas Whedon to write something similar to the effect, but not a sequel in the same universe. Because I just think yeah. the ending is so perfect, um, for what they were trying to accomplish. I get it. Yeah. That I think it would just make the entire first film like a moot point if they made a second you know right 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 and yeah and even like again like you were saying like if it was a prequel you're kind of just like getting to a point like there's no there's not going to be a lot of surprises in it unless they like they would have to change the idea that things like don't mess up that much and then it would kind of ruin this one again because you'd be like oh well they mess up all the time and it's kind of like no that's the, the point is that they don't they had all the tools to mess up, but they hadn't done it. Much like, again, our American system. It's like everything runs fine until you have like a medical bill and then you yeah. get screwed I, over. I will say not a sequel, obviously. Um, prequel. But um, what I, I when I first saw this movie, I'd never seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I don't know if you guys have. But uh, I ended up watching all of it uh, with my wife during the pandemic. And... And after that, like going back and seeing stuff, it's like, oh, like everything Joss Whedon did after this is like in Buffy. Like even kind of the underground base where they're secretly controlling monsters is in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So it's very like, okay, you could kind of like, you could see shades of everything he was going to do. And a lot of like meta stuff too. I mean, it it does do very like kind of along those lines. So 
you well, know, it is funny because, there's a lot like, out there if you like this movie. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's that thing where it's like, you know how I knew that Josh Whedon was going to be good at Avengers and not at DC? It's because if there's a way for him to sneak a secret government organization into a movie, he's going to do it. Like, he put it in Angel. He put it in this one. Of course, there's S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, he loves. He's going to put that in every movie he can, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, like, the best, it's that kind of thing where, like, we, we watched uh, Hellraiser 3 the other day, and that's kind of a nihilistic movie, but it's like, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Hellraiser 3, but it's like a 90s horror film, so, like, mm -hmm. it's very, like, sitcom lighting and stuff, <laughs> and I think it's funny to kind of watch nihilistic movies like this, where it's like, the tone isn't nihilistic, it's kind of what they're trying to tell you with the, with the themes and mm -hmm. stuff. Had yeah, no. but yeah, so I think it's because I'm not a huge fan of like super dark nihilistic movies, although we did again just talk about audition and how much <laughs> we like that kind of stuff. But I like it, I, like, I always feel like if it's going to be nihilistic, it has to kind of have a message behind it, and yeah. like audition clearly does, and this one clearly does, and it makes me like enjoy it a lot more. Um, and it's one of the reasons that, like, yeah, if I find out that there's like if it has like great themes, and I, I watch anything. <laughs> yeah i think it's great so uh molly do you have any other any other thoughts mm, let me check my notes <laughs> <laughs> i have like uh, i have like five notes and most of them are about the merman so you definitely did more <laughs> this than me i was like yay the merman <laughs> so. i think one clever thing that they did in this is um i know a big thing in horror movies and like critiquing horror is that some characters make some really stupid decisions and this film kind of implies that within the horror film like any horror film that you watch which is meant to be something that is pleasing to you the characters are going to be manipulated by some outside force either way so you can't really blame the characters for the decisions that they make in horror films and I was like <laughs> I see it. I don't like yeah. it, but I see it. And I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, and it, well, because they, they tell me like it has to be their choice. And to me, that implies like, oh, you, the audience needs to believe that these are real people right. making their own choices, right. even though in the back of your mind, you know, like, okay, now he wrote that she goes into the basement and dies. You know, it's like, yes. okay, but you need to, you need that like, um, yeah. You know, don't break kayfabe, like, or, or it's yeah. going to mess up your enjoyment, which, you know, like I said, yeah, there's, medical. there's literally a scene where they're like, yeah, suspend your disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so what do you guys think about there? It's like this movie and then like Shaun of the Dead, Sam Raimi's kind of the expert in this, where it's like, they're kind of parodies and satires, but they're also like explorations of the, because if you watch Shaun of the Dead, as just like a zombie movie, it still works as a zombie. And like this one, anytime someone gets killed, it's pretty horrific. So it still works as like a horror movie, but it's also like exploring the tropes. I wish like, like we need a new name for like a movie that works inside of the of the move of the genre, but it's also kind of commentaring commentating on it, and it's also like a little bit tongue in cheek. I guess Raimi. <laughs> just call it. This is a Sam Raimi movie. <laughs> Yeah, I can. Because Sam Raimi does it accidentally, even when he's not trying to yes. make jokes. <laughs> that is true. He'll he'll throw Bruce Campbell like, out down some stairs just to make himself laugh. <laughs> and it usually works. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Bruce Campbell's book, but he said that like he on the Quick and the Dead, he like went to go visit Sam Raimi. And there was, like, this stunt coordinator that was, like, really annoying him, Sam Raimi. And so Sam Raimi was like, oh, you know what? That actor is a stunt guy. Do show him all the stunts and do them on him, and then he'll come tell me. And he was, like, pointing at Bruce Campbell, who's just visiting. And so Bruce Campbell, like, went off with him. And he kept having him do stunts. And Bruce Campbell was like, what, what, are, you, what are we doing? And he was, like, throwing up these walls and stuff. <laughs> And it's always it's always funny to see Sam Raimi do. It's always funny. Like I saw someone the other day online called Sam Raimi pretentious. It's like the guy who puts his car in every movie is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> like the ultimate prankster of horror. 
I saw somebody on Twitter talking about how they want an end to comedy, like horror comedies, and that Shaun of the Dead had started it all and they wish it never existed. And I was like, do you hate fun? Like, horror doesn't have to be like, if you want a horror, horror, pure horror movie, go watch one. But like, right. Yeah, they they release hundreds a year. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's like my biggest pet peeve is I like, the whole like, oh, is this horror or not? It's like such a boring. Like if you're if you get a little scared, call it a horror. If anyone asks me, like, oh, what's the best jump scare? It's gonna be in Mulholland Drive. Mm. It's just gonna oh. happen. Like you like the best directors will take stuff from every yes. genre and kind of use it when it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. Like you have like in Zodiac, like Zodiac's very straightforward crime, but you have this scene where he goes into the basement and it's scary as hell, and uh, you don't know what's gonna happen. So good. Yeah. And so it's kind of like I would rather be like tricked. For like a few minutes into thinking I've accidentally walked into a horror film so that they can like raise attention mm-hmm. then like oh this is a drama so it's just gonna be drama, drama yeah. stuff the whole time yeah. like is Lydia and Tar like, horror yeah I'm worried she's gonna lose her tenure because yeah. people are out yeah. to get her <laughs> I think everything every single genre <laughs> is true horror if you think about it in the right way yeah and yeah, and it, well, and I even I'll give a personal example of this. When we did the last ones, my first movie, which you should watch on Tubi, um, I didn't put that many jokes because in my head I was like, "Oh no, this is serious. This is horror." Sure. And uh, there was like a few, but it was like wisecracks from the characters, but there wasn't anything like that I would say was like a joke, you know. Mm-hmm. And we, I, you know, I like that movie. I'm proud of that movie, but. After I watched that movie in an audience, I was like, you know what? Like real life, you know, I've I've had issues with like depression and with anxiety. And even during those times, which uh, if you watch The Empty Space coming soon, you'll find out more. Even in those times of mental illness, there was still stuff that was funny. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons that I got into Empty Space, which is about mental illness, was because when I had like severe anxiety and severe depression, I didn't think I did because every depiction I had seen on TV was the dude crying 24 seven. And like, he wouldn't leave his house. And it's like, well, I go to the gym every day. And I like, mm-hmm. I watch, I, mean, I had watched, I was like watching 30 rock on repeat and I was like laughing. And so I was like, so it can't be me. Cause I'm like, I still have like some fun. And it wasn't until like someone asked me <laughs> if I had anxiety that like I fucking broke down and I was like, Oh yeah, that's what that is. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I think, like, this idea that, like, if you're making a horror movie, there shouldn't be any jokes. It's just kind of, like, that's just not how real life is, yeah. you know? And I think, like, to me, I would rather have, a, like, a better depiction, like, so that if it feels more like real life, it feels scarier because I feel like this could be happening right now, mm-hmm. even while we're sitting here, you know? And so I just think, like, it's kind of, like, changed the way I've viewed that kind of argument, you know? Yeah. We're getting deep on this one. <laughs> yeah. It's me, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think, you know, I, as always, like, I always kind of forget about this movie because I just remember that I like it. And then I'll, like, sometimes watch the scene with all the monsters. But, like, watching it in its entirety again, you really have, like, so much fun. Like, from the first shot of the movie to the last frame it's like a good it's time so much fun. yeah and it's very it's one of those where i was like oh yeah it's pretty good whatever and then i was watching like you know turning it back on i was like oh yeah this is really good like yeah. this is like so well made you know right yeah. I, I rewatched it last night and i changed my letterbox rating from four to five stars which is like nice. that's a big deal <laughs> right <laughs> perfect yeah and yeah i think it's especially if you like horror i don't see how you could not like this movie no. but so check it out. But yeah, any final thoughts on the Kevin in the Woods? I just wish we got to see Kevin. <laughs> or maybe we did. Maybe it was a robot all along. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Well, th- Molly, uh, if people wanted to follow you, I know you have a Twitter and a letterbox. Yes. You said. Um, my letterbox is, it's an embarrassing name. I made it when I was younger. It's <laughs> at a whore for a two four. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, my Twitter where I tweet about films and also things that come in my brain, uh, is at Molly's films. Cool. And I'll link them as always, but just so you know, 
Um, I, I feel like when I watch a podcast, if someone says it, I'll like type it in as I'm listening. So I always mm-hmm. have them say it. And I, my letterbox is not for everyone because I use my full name, <laughs> which I guess gives it away. And I give my real opinions on movies. And mm-hmm. usually on Twitter, I, I don't like to be named. <laughs> I'm in the industry. And so I, don't like to, I only give my letterbox to a select few. Of them. I'm so they special. Can see that I, I'm special because yeah. I have your letterbox. Or, yeah. Yeah, Mo, that's how I knew she was going to be on the podcast because I, I gave like it comes in a, like an envelope that's gold and you open yeah. it like in, it was uh, very six, official <laughs> confetti confetti everywhere big cleanup yeah. and it just says two stars for uh, the last one <laughs> so also people like I saw another director and he like doesn't rate his movies he just like says that he watched it oh no it's, it's getting five stars. <laughs> and I'll, I mean, I'll put that I, I made it, but uh, yeah, you get five star. If I make it, that's a five star type film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but thank you guys for following the Bomb Squad. Um, we'll come back next week, and we'll bring Molly back when we want to talk about audition. I'm putting it on the air so that we have to do it. <laughs> um, and yeah, thanks for joining us. Like and subscribe if you want, and we'll see you. Thanks for watching The Bomb Squad. Please, while you're here, give us a like and a subscribe. We really appreciate it and it means a lot.